dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all he does. The Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. This next song is actually a versification of the first half of that song, which we did not read. And I dedicate it to Mr. Neil Hand, who liked this this too. <laughs> Monday morning, and so when um, I'll make contact with her, and then we'll take it from there, and we'll we'll pray that the word is good, and um, that she'll make a, make a recovery. It was outpatient surgery. Uh, any word on Cecil and Linda? I haven't heard anything from them. Cecil Cecil has been in a um, in a nursing home. He recovered from hernia surgery. Cecil's 93 and proved too much for Linda to care for at home. And so she's been caring for him, or he's been being cared for in a nursing home. How can we pray, Cynthia? Um, uh, asking more prayers for my aunt Sophie, so she's back in the hospital. You know, she has the cancer, she has stroke, she survived all that. Now she's in the hospital and they say she has a spot on her so we 
Okay. So prayers for Sophie, that's Marshall's sister. She's been through breast cancer, been through all these things, and now there's a spot on her pancreas. Obviously, doctors are concerned. Prayers that this too will be something benign. Marshall's obviously concerned for her. And um, continued prayers for, for that whole family. Delphine. Continued prayers for my girlfriend, Dina. What's your name, Dina? Dina. Dina. Okay. Yeah, just going to be for Dina. She had to have her two surgery and had a colonoscopy. And they had to go back in a couple days under a year. And they had to relocate the bag. And it's a lifestyle change. Uh, and a lot to absorb, especially you know, the hospital was locked down last Thursday at 2 o'clock in the morning. So when I got to the hospital to go see her, I just told her I could not come in. So uh, uh, her face is strong. Okay. All right. So prayers for Dina, Delphine's friend. Um, she had surgery on her colon. She has a bag. Um, Delphine tried to go and visit her. Hospital was locked down. So, but Dina's faith is strong. And so prayers for that she can adjust to the bag and everything will come back into order. So I think also prayers in terms of COVID, Sacramento has reached some record highs in terms of testing per days. That obviously means that there's community spread. Um, there's concern with all the Fourth of July celebration. That a lot of the a lot of the spread has been now. I mean, the reason they closed the bars and the indoor restaurants is because of the spread, obviously. And let's pray that the numbers will go down. And, you know, especially pray that the hospitals don't get overwhelmed because that's when things really get dangerous when people can't get the kind of treatment that they need. So, and Edie. Remember Corinne? Yes, Corinne. So Corinne doesn't have it, but there's an outbreak in her, um, in, in her apartment complex. And so obviously she's concerned there. And so prayers for her. keep our equilibrium, keep, keep our connections. It's vitally important. And so I know many are staying at home and that's exactly fine and, and what you should do. But um, it's so good to see each other in church and we're all spaced out. I think, you know, we everybody but me right now has a mask or a shield on. So um, well, those two scoff laws in back. But. <laughs> But I praise God that we're able to be here, and um, I don't think we have any plans to, to stop again. So that's where we're at. Jackie. So Richard's mother celebrated 97 years. <gasps> and uh, she's doing just well. Good. And we were able to go to the side gate and to the patio to visit her. Good. And it just lifted, lifted us up. Yes. Yes. How's her memory? Well, you know. Yeah. But she knew you. She knows us. She might not remember the name, but she knows. Okay. Good. 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 I'm glad. Also, I got a text from many of you. Um, no, Andrew. 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 Um, last. Not this past week, but the week before, he, um, I bought a car from him, one of his cars, because he was leaving, 
and for my daughter. And so he packed up a big truck and drove that truck all the way to Hackettstown, New Jersey, all by himself. And he texted me Thursday or Friday, I don't remember which, I think Friday, and said he had arrived, he'd gotten the truck empty, he turned in the truck, there were no incidents or accidents or anything, and so he's with his wife right now in Hackettstown, New Jersey, and I think continued prayer for them as there's all kinds of, they're living in her, his wife's mother's, his wife, a long story, but anyway, just prayers for them as, you know, they work through things as they have to work through things. So, Edie. Yeah, my sister in law, Montana, her 93 year old mother is failing. Um, and it's, she just wants to go home. She really wants to, but she had some incidents of hallucinations. They actually request the family to stay with her 24 7. It's gotten some better, but um, just for that whole difficult situation that they all want to that time. Okay. So, Edie's um, sister in law, her mother is 93. She just wants to go to be with the Lord. And, um, and you know, continued prayers for Earl. Can't make contact with Earl. He can't really talk on the phone. He can't understand him. But for years now, Earl has wanted to go to be with the Lord and be reunited with Lenore. And so, and now, you know, I can't visit him. I, this, you know, it's just terribly hard for people who are in an institution. Mark and Veronica aren't here this morning, but the same with Veronica's mother. Um, sometimes, I'm so glad your visit went well because many times I hear from people and the visit was just more painful than, than anything. Well, the caregivers are really needing help with um, uplift because they're there with them all the time and there's no relief, you know, when normally um, family would come and visit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My mother-in-law wants to walk all the time, and she can't really do it by herself. And she wears them out. <laughs> wow, wow. Okay. All right. Nancy, it's so good to see you. Uh, we are uh, really happy to have a new neighbor. It's next door to us. And uh, Mark and 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 So Mark and Lisa Holland, most of you know them, they bought the house right next door to Maury and Nancy. So, um, and I just, I just saw them this week too, and they're happy to be in a bigger space. They were in a tiny little house in Midtown with four children. And so just when this whole, excuse me, when this whole thing hit, they have a bigger house, have a nice backyard with a swimming pool, nice house to be able to endure this pandemic. They're not all, boxed in together. Uh, many of you might remember Elijah. Elijah was born when Mark and Lisa were here on their residency, and he just graduated from high school this year and um, looking at college next year. So, those kids grow up. Makes me feel old. Yeah, I know, I know. Well, wait till your grandkids get there. They're not far behind, Roger. Wonderful. Wow, wonderful, wonderful. Um, thank you for hosting that. The meetup, obviously, we haven't been meeting. Maybe, you know, we got a lot of space in this room. We can open doors. We'll figure things out as this thing endures, but that's where we're at. Okay. Freddie. Oh, oh. Go ahead, Freddie. Go ahead, Pete. All right, so two things. My mom was in, the, was in the ER last night. I don't know how that went because my sister went to bed and didn't tell me how it went. But I know she had a very long wait, um, about an eight hour wait to see somebody. And they basically, the message was you need to see a specialist, which of course, look at the July isn't yeah. very helpful. But um, so prayers for her. And she should be in the home right now, but it's probably good that she's not because of the COVID issue. Yeah. Um, and then my symptoms are back. I've been fighting a super bug since March. I'm not contagious, so nobody has to worry about getting anything from me. But um, it's E. 
people are, for example, responding antibiotics. And uh, this is the longest I've, been. I've gone without antibiotics I went from a week ago Monday till Friday night. Of course, on holiday weekend, it's weird since I've been here. <laughs> but um, so I'm back to square one again. They've tried five different antibiotics. I'm just thinking nothing's gotten rid of it completely. I don't know if they're going to try one of them again just for longer or what's going to happen. Um, but because it seems to, most of them seem to work temporarily, they just don't do the long term fix. Okay. Um, there's one that doesn't work at all. Um, and we know which one that is. But uh, we'll see. All right, so prayers for you and also for the job hunt. Yeah, so it makes the job hunt a little tricky because I'm sick again. Yeah. yeah. But um, we'll see. Okay. All right. Thanks, Pete. So good you're here. Freddie, did you have something? Just for everybody in the church and for my mom and my boyfriend, and my sister, and my buddy Justin, and please pray. Freddie asked for prayers for him and Nancy, and Freddie's back in one of the houses he was in before, and sometimes issues with the other residents, sometimes issues with the staff, so I mean, prayers. It's okay, but I guess I should have good things happen All right, well, it's a work in pro, it's a work, with, bit by bit, Freddie, bit by bit. Right. Let's go to our God in prayer. Lord, it is a blessing to be here today and to be here with, with all who have gathered. And we know, Lord, that many others are online. And we thank you, Lord, for them as well. And, and Lord, we just try to keep the numbers here in the room low and we keep masks on and we do all these. We do our due diligence to keep one another safe. But Lord, we need each other. And it's just really good to be back and to see each other. And Lord, we need you. And I know that we are your hands and your feet. We are your presence in each other's lives in many ways. That's how the church works. And so we thank you, Lord. Lord, there are many requests for illness for some of our seniors in their 90s, uh, parents, sisters. There are many requests for for those who are having medical issues and the hospitals are distracted and encumbered by the COVID virus on top of all the other challenging medical situations. And Lord, we as a country feel the tensions and, and see the, the strains between racial groups, see the strains between economic groups, see the strains between political groups. And Lord, many of the systems that we have to, to try to keep a level of peace are, are under siege. And there are many things, Lord, that, are, that we as a nation are struggling with. And many things that Many of us as individuals are struggling with, struggling with our health, struggling with our finances, struggling with the relationships with those we share our homes, struggling with our faith. Because Lord, the daily patterns and weekly patterns of Bible study and prayer and church have been disrupted. And Lord, we might first imagine that, oh look, I've got more free time. But very quickly, the doubts emerge and the anxieties and the strains. And so, Lord, we call out to you. We call out to you individually in our homes. We call out to you together 
here in this place. And we ask, Lord, have mercy. Come quickly to our aid. Lord, in all of this, we are not sinless. All the variations of human sins we carry, sins of biases of one kind or another against people of different races, of different sexes, of different social groups, of different nations, all of the petty little, petty little lists of grievances we have against our spouses, our parents, our children, our co-workers, the people that, with whom we share this sanctuary in this church. All of these different things, Lord, that we carry and we carry until we can't carry them anymore and then we, we sprout out that we are their victims and we have a grievance and on we go and the lists get longer and the grievances develop mutually and very quickly we no longer are able to speak with one another. Lord, you know all these things. None of these things are new on this planet. All of these things we struggle with and wrestle with every day. But you, Lord, come to us. And you hear our prayers. And you listen to our complaints. And you listen to the, the sorrow in our soul. And you don't hold our sins against us because of the sacrifice of your Son. Lord, we pray that you would hear our prayers. We pray that you would be near especially to those who are locked into nursing homes and hospitals. We pray for those, Lord, who are caring for them and who are struggling because of the suffering that is going on. We pray, Lord, that we might have the the self-discipline to, to keep the distance and wear the masks and do all the important things we know we need to do. May we be patient with one another. May we be generous towards one another. May we love not only those who are good to us, but may we love our enemies as well, whether or not we count them as enemies. Lord, you have showed us the way to live in peace to one another. And it is not yelling and screaming and blaming and finger pointing. In your prayer, you teach us that you will forgive us as we forgive those who sin against us. So help us, Lord, to be ready to forgive. Ready to let bygones be bygones. Ready to start a relationship in a new day and ready to not only preach, but practice your love in our homes, in our workplaces, in our city, in our nation. Help us, Lord. Come quickly to our aid. Hear our prayer. In the name of Jesus, amen. The deacons are going to take the offering now and don't touch the bags. If you have an offering, just put it right in the, just put it right in the bag. When we do communion too, um, they're all little servings, they're all little things, and I'll show you then how to open them and do them. So I won't have touched anything, and actually it occurs to me that all these coverings that are traditional, are probably coverings for a reason from back in the day, so... It's all this ancient sanitary practice. Will the deacons please come forward?
Thanks, Raj. So the good news is the nation is united. The bad news is it's united in thinking things aren't going well. Found this week a great quote from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. from a sermon in 1957. Terrific line. So somehow the isness of our present nature is out of harmony with the eternal oughtness that forever confronts us. Is my mic not on? Did I turn it off? Battery's low. Down to one bar. So if it dies, it might have died. So if it dies, run me a new one. Now the proposed solutions always seem repetitive. A couple of weeks ago I mentioned this fella in my strange YouTube life, uh, Brett Weinstein, and meeting with another guy and they had Game B and they talked about the fact that the world has all these problems and and, and so a bunch of real smart people are going to get together and figure out the solutions and fix the world and, and stop all the crises that come to us. And this week he announced that he was going to have his Unity 2020 and he wants to get a center-left and a center-right person, kind of the Andrew Yang, resurrect Andrew Yang as a president of the as a presidential candidate to run against Biden and Trump. And then just yesterday, of course, Kanye announced that he's running for president and and, and Brett said, Bingo, contact me. And I thought, oh boy. We need more circus? Of course. <laughs> But as I mentioned in the previous sermons, all of these solutions are so predictable. Somehow gain power and then put that on people. And that's always the same solution. In terms of aspiring world changers, there was one man, one man, who in three years changed the world more than any other person in all of human history. He didn't do it with an army. He wasn't the leader of a government. He didn't even write a book. And towards the end of his earthly work, he in fact was so hated in the middle of a vicious culture war that if we would imagine the Romans and Jewish nationalists as a right and a left, the only thing these two could agree on, besides they didn't like the other side, was that they didn't like Jesus, so they put him to death. He is history's most successful changer of the world. Nobody else is even close. Tom Holland grew up, when he was six years old, he loved dinosaurs. He saw a picture somewhere of Adam and Eve and dinosaurs and went to his Sunday school teacher and said, hey, human beings and dinosaurs didn't live at the same time. And the Sunday school teacher didn't give him an answer that satisfied him, so he left the church. And then much later as an adult, began to study ancient history and began to notice that the ancient history that he loved was incredibly barbaric. The kinds of peaceful protests we see today would have been laughed at by the Romans. When Julius Caesar went into Gaul, he killed more than a million people and enslaved another million and bragged about it because that gave him political success. And Tom Holland began to notice that we don't work that way. If you kill a million people, it's a genocide and people want to take down your statue. 
And, and he began to notice that the world was different. And the more he read ancient history and compared the world today, he said, this is all due to one man. And in, a, in an interview, he said this, imagine you've got to write a story in which for the first time, someone who suffers the excruciating death of a slave is going to be cast as being in some way part of the creator God who fashioned everything. And he's got to be convincing, not just to people now, but for 2,000 years and across the whole span of the world. It's really an astonishing thing to have pulled off as a literary feat, and that four people did it, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, within a very short amount of time, is astounding. Over this course of 50 years, we can't even agree who's a hero and who's a villain. But Jesus, over 2,000 years, continues to be taken seriously. Now you might say, well, what can I do? I'm one person sitting at a distance from others in a tiny little church in Sacramento, California. Well, the apostles were nobody's too, and their isness and their oughtness was pretty far away from each other as well. So you begin at home. And you begin in your relationships. We've been looking at the Sermon on the Mount. And if you take a look at the items from the Sermon on the Mount, they're both remarkably personal. In other words, you don't need to ask permission from people to do these things. But they're also remarkably scalable. They can apply even to large groups of people. And here in the Sermon on the Mount, which many people say, oh Jesus, he, he was a great moral leader. After 2,000 years, the brightest minds in the world, when they look at this sermon, still can't quite summarize it all in one place. And so we, we looked at the structure a little bit. And, and even the most brilliant people can't quite get their minds around it. But a couple of weeks ago we said, when you get all the way to the center of the sermon, because it's sort of arranged like a Russian nest doll, at the center of the sermon is a tiny little prayer, small enough for children to memorize. And, and, and we talked about the fact that many people say, I don't know how to pray. And so Jesus gives you this. There it is. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Right there. Start there. You don't have to pick the right presidential candidate. You don't have to find some leader who's going to make laws and fix the economy. Start there. And so that's the center. That's kind of the, the tiny little doll at the middle of the Russian the Russian nesting doll. The second layer is threefold. And we're in the third phase of that this week. Because it's always the same pattern around it. And it has everything to do with, well, three things. Prayer, money, and then today we're going to talk about, of all things, fasting. And, and the pattern Jesus uses for all these three things is clear. Be careful not to practice your righteousness. We talked about that two weeks ago. That's the thing inside that makes you, that makes you do good. Be, care not to, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward with your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, don't let your left hand know what the right hand is doing. And when you pray, 
Do not be like the hypocrites who love to pray standing in the synagogues, for they've received their reward. But do it in secret, and your Father will hear you and reward you. And this week, when you fast, do not look somber like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces to show others how they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. If you remember the other weeks, same with money, same with prayer, now with fasting. There's your reward. You have it. I tell you, they have received their reward in full. For when you fast, put oil on your head, wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to others who are fasting, but only to your Father, who is unseen. And your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. All these three examples deal with the moral show. And if you read the news, or on Facebook, or Twitter, or Instagram, most of what we see today is the moral show. In politics, in celebrity, between neighbors, between family. He makes this point three times. And this is a man who is crucified. And the Apostle Paul numerous times pointing to the crucifixion highlights this little verse from Deuteronomy that says, if someone is guilty of a capital offense and put to death and their body is exposed on a pole or a tree, you must not leave the body hanging there because anyone hung on a pole or a tree is under God's curse. In other words, Jesus, the most successful changer of world history, was not preoccupied with his moral reputation. That really is hard for us to hear in church. Now, now fasting itself, if I preach this sermon, I've preached this text a number of times over the years, but fasting has made a comeback, and not in terms of religion. Fasting has made a comeback in terms of fitness, and it used to be that when someone would say, I don't know what to eat, through most of human history that meant they didn't have anything to eat. Now we're in a situation where we have too much to eat. In fact, we could make a good argument that one way or another we are eating ourselves to death. And so fasting has made a comeback. And so people fast in order to look good and lose weight and feel better and have more energy because we just keep eating ourselves to death. Was this what Jesus was talking about? Not really. If you remember back in the sermon series about 1 Peter and a bunch of the other letters of Paul, there's this funny Greek word, epithumia, which is an over-desire. And, and one of the things that Peter and Paul recognize is we have these over-desires. And so when I have a fight with the wife, what do I want to do? Eat a bowl of ice cream or maybe a quart of ice cream or stress in the house. What do I want to do? I'm going to go smoke a pack of cigarettes or I'm going to go shopping or I'm going to binge Netflix. Part of how we manage ourselves emotionally is we get out of ban a balance and we inundate ourselves with different stimulus to try to distract ourselves from our anxieties and our fears. Well, they knew this in the ancient world, and so part of the way that they helped to manage themselves with was fasting. And so if, if, if we would feel ourselves a little bit out of control in terms of our emotions and our relationships, ancient people would fast. And also they fasted, and remember last week we talked about prayer as a slot machine. They would fast because they believed that there were all these powerful gods floating around, and the gods were begrudging and withholding. And so you'd go to the god and say, I really need to have 
I don't know, I really want to have that relationship over there with that man or that woman, or I really want this field to do well, or I really want my animals to reproduce. And the guy would be like, oh, okay, how bad do you want it? Well, well, I'll give lots of sacrifices. Oh, okay, but that's just, you've already got a lot of animals. I'll starve myself. I'll do a hunger strike and then begrudging God, maybe you'll give me what I want. And again, we learned last week, Jesus says, your father in heaven is not like that. He already knows what you need. But yet fasting then for Christians became a way to, I don't want to lust. I don't want to be a glutton. I don't want to be a drunkard. I'm going to deny my body to train myself to be able to not be mastered by my desires. And so fasting became a Christian practice. But once that becomes a value in the economy, in the moral economy, in the relational economy, now it's like, well, I don't drink alcohol. Well, I don't drink alcohol and I don't smoke. Well, I don't drink alcohol, and I don't smoke, and I don't eat beef. Well, I don't drink alcohol, and I don't smoke, and I only eat chickens that have had, been able to run around in the farmyard and not had stress in their little cages. Well, I don't eat chickens at all. I only eat fish. Well, I don't even eat fish. I only eat plants. Well, I only eat plants that have been grown where there's been lovely music around them and loving tender, tender gardeners that before they pluck each tomato, they say, here, little tomato, thank you for your gift to me. Can you see how we play these games with one another? Well, this sort of happened in Christianity with fasting. And so you had monks who would take... I'm going to take a vow of poverty and I'm not going to own anything. And we're all going to live together in this monastery and devote ourselves to prayer. And they did. And it was wonderful. And everybody else looked at them and said, wow, they really love God. That's inspiring. I'm going to give them money. And guess what? People kept giving them money. And the monks took a vow of poverty, but the money went somewhere. And if you go to Europe or many places, you go to these monasteries and it's like the art and the architecture and that didn't cost nothing. The monasteries themselves became rich. And then other monks were like, oh, I don't want to be rich like those monasteries. I'm going to start my own order and I'm going to live in a hovel in the desert. And, and I'm going to sit up on top of a pole and, and I'm going to struggle worse than everybody else and I'm going to do it in secret. And guess what? People heard rumors of these desert fathers living in the desert. So what did they do? They went out to see them. This is a human reaction that is so perpetual to us. And so part of what happened in the Protestant Reformation is they said, no more monasteries because that became a religious game. But then we had other religious games. Then it was, I gave more money to the church, I pray more, I sacrifice more. Well, you can take this out of a religious context. Just look at a, look at a fight in a marriage or relationship. Well, you come home every night and you don't do a thing, and I've been cooking and cleaning and taking care of the kids. I do all of this sacrifice, and you take advantage. Does that sound familiar? I make all of the money, and you skate. I listen to all your complaints, and I never complain myself. We gain moral standing by our sufferings. Well, 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 my group of people have been the victims of your group of people. They very well may have been. But now, because of Christianity, the victim has standing. The victim has privilege. So if you use that privilege, even gained by victimhood, Jesus says, well, there's your reward. Everyone looks at you and says, Oh, they have suffered so much. 
Congratulations, you have status. A large degree of world maintaining, not even fixing, requires regular, unseen self-denial and sacrifice. How many of you haven't seen it and done it as parents? The child gets up in the middle of the night. You get up. Donna's doing it for another dog. <laughs> if Don had come into church, oh, my dog is, my dog is causing me so much suffering, I'd say, Donna, get rid of the dog. So much of the world runs on unseen suffering. Every good parent does it. Every good spouse does it. Every good citizen does it. Every good member of a community does it. Most of it goes unseen. And when people draw attention to themselves, other people look at them and say, oh, you know, that's a first world problem. Or, you know, poor Kim has to deal with Kanye's craziness. Yeah, poor Kim. A lot of us aren't feeling sorry for her. Jesus says, don't play the game. When you suffer, suffer quietly. Don't draw attention to yourself. And your Father who sees will reward you. You say, yeah, but I'm not sure. Well, that's exactly why we cash in now. And at the center of it, is a man who hangs on a cross. And nobody said, oh, look at how he's suffering for us. His disciples were hiding because it was a catastrophe and they thought they were going to be next. Both sides were mocking and enjoying this. But what no one could see was what is now clear 2,000 years later, and even clear 15 years later when the Apostle Paul wrote this. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love for us while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. And many of you have seen that echoed time and time again in a loved one, a parent, a school teacher, someone who, think back, when you were young, didn't know anything, were ungrateful, didn't have any wisdom, and they were patient, they were kind, they endured. How did Jesus change the world? This is how he did it. How can you change the world? Is this somehow are you barred by the government from doing this? No. There's no law that can be had against this. But you say, oh, but the people around me don't deserve. No, they don't. And neither do we. That's the heart of this. And at the heart of this was a meal. On the night he was betrayed. What does that word mean? That means one of his friends, one of his chosen twelve, sold him to his political enemies for 30 pieces of silver. On the night he was betrayed, now this is going to be a little different from what we usually do. There's a little flap, a little clear flap that will release the little bread. And then the bigger flap releases the juice and, you know, there might be a little spillage, so take your time with it. Not a big deal. 
You'll have to take your mask off to drink it. That's okay. But on the night he was betrayed, this is new for me too, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my broken body that I give to you. Do this in remembrance of me. forgiveness of all your sins. They don't have to distribute it again. You have another song? No? no? Okay. So you can take that flip and slowly unpeel the grape juice. Or one. I don't know what's in it. It's grape juice. Grape juice? Okay. <laughs> he also poured a cup and said, This is a new covenant in my blood. 
The world works tit for tat, retribution, and Jesus comes and says, it's your well-being at my expense. Take, drink, remember and believe that your Lord gave his blood for the complete forgiveness of all your sins. Would you stand? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen.